Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Jasinski. Obviously, I'm with OSU Extension, the IPM program. Uh, I'm here with Celeste Welty, Department of Entomology, and um, General Small Fruit Fruit Specialist. And she'll, she and I will both be carrying the weight of the Spot Wing webinar today. Um, really, what I hope to do is, is to welcome you as new cooperators to the Spotted Wing uh, Monitoring Network. And basically, I wanted to give you sort of the ABC of how to do the monitoring. This webinar is designed to kind of get you up and running for the season. Um, we did have a, a more full hands-on workshop um, back in April in Marietta, but I know that you know that might have been difficult for you to get to. And so this is going to be an abbreviated version of that. So if something seems a little unclear, or maybe a little bit rushed, that's because we typically take three hours to do this kind of presentation. So we're gonna trade back and forth, Celeste and I, we're gonna have some videos in here. Um, otherwise, I think um, that's all that I have for now, and then we'll just kind of launch right into it. Um, yeah, that's all my notes have for right now. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, and get into it. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen right now. I'll get this out of the way. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we'll get started right here. All right, so we sort of went over this already. This was just the basics of Celeste and I talking about the biology, monitoring, identification, and management of spotted wing Drosophila. Uh, these are the topics that we're going to cover today. Uh, brief welcome and slight introductions, which we've done already. Celeste will then start with uh, the life cycle, the damage, and the distribution. Uh, I'll kind of take over talking about the monitoring, talking about taking the uh, contents of the trap and moving it over to the vials. Then we're going to talk about sorting and identification, larval monitoring using saltwater tests. Celeste will then take back over and talk about chemical and non-chemical uh, management options. And then we're going to end with any questions and conclusions. And then we'll send you a link later on with evaluations. And we hope to be out of here by no later than 1030. If we finish earlier, that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, what do we hope that you get out of this thing? Well, by the end of the webinar, we're hoping that you understand the life cycle and the potential damage of the spotted wing Drosophila. Uh, hopefully you'll figure out how to um, pick a site to monitor, how to put those traps out, service those traps, um, sort and identify the specimens, and then conduct saltwater tests to look for larvae in the fruit. Uh, if we do find spider wing, um, if you find spider wing, uh, hopefully you'll understand kind of the basics of how to begin the pest management procedures and protocols. And um, if any of this doesn't stick the first time through, we want to be sure to point you to where those resources are held for spider wing so you can go ahead and look those up later on. In terms of the actual monitoring supplies, these are going to be the things that we supply to you. Uh, two traps, six to eight lures, some vials and labels, a squeeze bottle, petri dish, sorting grid. I think somebody might have their um, station open. I'm hearing some echoing. So if you don't, aren't on mute, could you please do that for me? Um, paintbrush, funnel, saltwater container, which we'll get to later, kind of a separator of the fruit that goes in the container, uh, where the fact sheets are. And I know a few of you, need to borrow stereo microscopes for the identification, I think we'll be able to loan those out to you for the season. The things we're not gonna to provide to you are gonna be the salt, the apple cider vinegar, or the preservation alcohol, either the ethanol or the isopropyl. If you can't get 70% ethanol, which you know might be a little bit difficult, 70% uh, isopropyl works just fine, and you can pick that up uh, at grocery stores and, and things of that nature. Uh, so with that, I think um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Celeste uh, to uh, pick up life cycle damage and distribution. So let me stop sharing. All right, Celeste. Okay, so first we're just going to give you a uh, introduction to this pest, uh, what its damage looks like, its life cycle, and an introduction to the identification that then Jim will get into in more detail. So the species name of this is Drosophila suzukii. Uh, so the word Drosophila should be familiar to people. It's a well-known genus, but the Suzuki eye is a new species for us in the USA. 
It looks very similar to our common vinegar fly that's found on overripe fallen decaying fruit. You probably see them in your kitchen if you have a lot of tomatoes sitting around like in August and September. But this new species attacks healthy ripening fruit before it's harvested, whereas the common vinegar fly is on the overripe fruit. Anyway, the um, origin of this, it came from Asia. Um, it's been in Asia for a long time. It, it's been in Hawaii for quite a while, but then it was 2008 and invaded California. And then after that, it just exploded all over the entire country. Uh, in 2011 is when we picked it up, and it was also picked up that year in many, many other states. The hosts, uh, you'll see pictures of these in a minute, but basically it progresses through different hosts as the different fruit begin to ripen and get sweet and soft. Early on, it's in cherries. In mid-season, it gets in raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. Later on, it gets in peaches, plums, and grapes. For strawberry, it yes, it, it does get in strawberries if they're ever bearing, so that's later in the summer, but so far it is not getting into strawberries for the typical May or June bearing strawberries. So in Ohio, most of the reports, the most severe damage we hear about is on blackberries and raspberries, but we definitely are getting some reports from blueberries, peaches, and grapes. So here is, um, a series of pictures about what the injury looks like on raspberries here just to give you the size perspective you can see that's the adult fly on the surface of the raspberry uh, and then the picture on the right you can see the uh, at least one or there are probably several larvae inside of that fruit uh, the key rule here is that the fruit is susceptible to injury once it's started to turn color. That's our, like our rough rule of thumb for any of these crops. So basically they don't seem to be attracted to unripe fruit, but as it starts to ripen and turn color, they're attracted. Here it is in blueberry. Uh, in this particular case, we see an egg on the surface of the fruit. There's a female sitting over here on the left side. Uh, and the fruit, you can see very rapidly, starts to rot. Here are some pictures in strawberry. Again, from a distance, it might not look that bad, but if you get up close, you see these bad spots. And then if you press into the fruit, you see the, the little white larvae inside. Here it is on peaches. Uh, again, peaches very close to harvest when you start noticing little uh, holes in the fruit, little soft spots. There's a little larva on the surface. More typically, the larvae are inside, you know, not on the surface, they're underneath, but sometimes they're on the surface. Here they are on grape. Again, here you see an adult fly on the surface of the grape. And on the right, you see the, an assortment of little larvae on the surface. Um, as you know, sweetness in grapes is measured by bricks levels. It's been found that spotted wing is most likely after you get above about 7.5 degrees bricks, but it's most common when you get more into the 17 to 22 degrees bricks, getting much sweeter. Here they are in cherry. Generally, cherries sort of escape because they're one of our earliest ripening fruit and we don't have all that many cherries in Ohio, um, but it can get in cherries. Again, typical damage, they start to rot and you see the, the larvae in there. So just to summarize, basically all the fruit are rather similar symptoms of just very quickly turning to mush. It seems though that the, the injury is worst in the sweetest, most thin-skinned fruit. Um, so basically, if they have a choice of several crops, they're more likely to be on the sweetest, thinnest ones. So a closer look at what this injury is like. It starts by egg laying and, and then it's followed by larval feeding. So it starts as just a tiny little scar on the skin of the fruit that the adult fly um, cuts uh, the, with the female, cuts it with her ovipositor. Um, the eggs hatch very quickly, the larvae feed inside the fruit you usually see the skin of the fruit start to collapse in just about two or three days. Then you get a lot of secondary issues like molds. Here's a close up of the egg. Sometimes the eggs are right on the surface of the berry, like the one up near the top. Other times, like the one at the bottom, the eggs are just tucked in just below the, the skin of the fruit. Uh, in this picture on the left, you can see this is the rear end of an adult female and she's popping an egg. So that white oval thing is the egg being pushed out uh, from her ovipositor. She has these saw-like teeth, we'll see it closer in a minute, that she uses to you know, cut a little um, slit in the surface of the fruit. So the, it's important to understand the life cycle, and I think it's very nicely um, diagrammed here. 
so if it, the, the cycle starts with the adult, an adult fly lives about 20 to 30 days. The female lays one to three eggs per site for a total in her lifetime of about 350 eggs. A really key thing is how fast they hatch in only 12 to 72 hours. Um, then they go through three larval instars, first larval instar, second larval, and third. Often the first is so small, it would be very difficult to see with the naked eye, but we definitely can see the third instars. But all three instars together take only five to seven days. So it's a very, very fast life cycle. Then they go through a pupil stage that takes about four to 15 days. They can pupate inside the fruit or outside the fruit. If it's outside the fruit, they typically drop to the ground, but not always. They're sometimes in the fruit. And then of course the new adults pop out of those pupae. And then, so here it is a total of eight to 16 days for one generation. So I think a few things related to this, I've just been mentioning the larvae, how there are three instars of the larvae. Um, we have started, we're trying hard to use the word larvae and we say it rather softly. Um, when I first gave the talk, I used to call these maggots, which is technically correct. The larva of a fly is a maggot. But we found out that the general public has a, a great, great fear of the word maggot. They think of flesh-eating maggots. So they worry that if they ate a spotted wing larva that they might, you know, be attacked in their gut by maggots, and that's not true. So we're trying to avoid using the word maggots. Here's just a close-up of the a pupa. Uh, the pupae, as I mentioned, some stay in or on the fruit, but many of them drop to the soil. They're about the size of a grain of rice. Just a little bit about seasonal trends of these stages. Usually, now Jim will go into a whole lot of detail about traps in a few minutes, but we usually get first activity of the adults, which um, we determine by when we're catching them in traps, is not until about mid-July. Occasionally we are finding a few in June at a few sites, but at most of the sites, things don't get started up till later. We know you get a higher catch or higher activity when it's cool and wet. They don't like it hot and dry. And usually the peak catch is very late in the year in September and October. So it's any of those really late um, ripening fruits are at great risk. So to summarize, you could say the status in Ohio is that the bad news is it has become a very widespread problem. They have been causing severe damage on both outdoor fruit crops as well as high tunnel fruit crops. That's mainly in the autumn. But you could say, good news if any, is that most growers have actually done a very good job at getting this under control, but usually if and only if they're using a fairly aggressive insecticide program. So we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but it's the people that typically had not been spraying these crops at all were just getting devastated by damage. Okay, um, just a little bit about identification of spotted wing. There are three features that we'll be looking at, the wings, the ovipositor, and the legs. So for the male, the male is a little easier to identify because he has these spots on his wings. Um, it's sort of a stupid name of the species. We call it spotted wing drosophila, but in fact those spots are really only found in the males, not the females. Um, but notice occasionally the spots can be absent on young newly emerged males. So that there is a, you know, in a small percent of the cases, you might miss identification because he just hadn't colored up yet. The other feature you have to look very closely on the, this lower picture is the front leg, uh, one of the two front legs, and they have this band, dark bands of combs on the front leg. And the females do not have those. And the other species of Drosophila do not have those. For the adult female, you'll see here, she does not ever have spots on her wings, but the distinctive feature is this saw-like ovipositor that has large, dark, more obvious teeth. So in this picture at the bottom, the one in the middle, spotted wing, you can really see how dark and noticeable those teeth are. Whereas next to that, the common vinegar fly, it does have teeth, but they're just much uh, lighter and um, not as um, sharp. And this is our plan for this year. Would really like to try and fill in some of those gaps. Our guess is that it is present in pretty much all counties, but um, we're trying to expand the network with some of you new cooperators to try and fill in some of these gaps. Because yellow is where it's suspected. Um, white is where it has not been yet surveyed. So that's it. I don't know why those didn't show up, but um, I think I'll stop sharing then if that's okay. Yeah, that was great, Celeste. Thank you. So. Um, let's see. 
I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay, so we're going to move on and talk about uh, adult monitoring using uh, baited traps. And so, um, really, there's always this question about why monitor adults. And um, you have to realize that monitoring is really one of the keystones of IPM, really, regardless of the crop, regardless of the pest. Monitoring of the status is very important in terms of the ultimate management. So, we ask the question, do you know if this pest is on your farm? Well, if you don't know, then you're gonna to need to monitor, need to trap for that. And it's really important for this particular pest because the threshold is really just one fly. And so we get that first detection and that really kicks our management into, uh, into gear. And the second question is, if we have that fly, then we have to know about what's the ripeness uh, of the fruit that's in that, in that field. Um, we know the flies, by themselves don't attack the foliage, they attack the fruit. And so that fruit has to be either ripening or ripe for it to be susceptible and for us to really get those management tactics rolling. So this next couple of slides is really dedicated to the monitoring of those adult flies. You can see over the years, we've had a lot of changes in the trap design. Uh, on the far left in 2012, we were using peanut butter jars, red duct tape, and drywall tape in some form or fashion. We went over uh, a little bit later and looked at you know, some modifications in terms of some of the bait. We used some commercial traps in 2014 and into 15, uh, deli jars, those kinds of things. But in the last couple of years, 2016 through this year, we've really settled on this century trap. Uh, we think it's um, a pretty durable trap. It seems to work uh, fairly well in screening out large insects that might have gotten into the other traps. And so we're really quite happy with it. That's one component. The next component is the bait. The bait is actually what attracts the spotted wing or other insects into the trap. And so it's really kind of the, one of the basic components. The basic bait, uh, I think Celeste mentioned it before, is really just apple cider vinegar. That's very attractive to spotted wing and other insects, unfortunately. And that's sort of seen as sort of the baseline bait that other baits are compared to. Um, other more sophisticated baits would be things like yeast and sugar baits, yeast and flour based baits. There are commercial baits available by companies such as Trace and Sentry. And then there are combination baits, which would be the commercial lures plus yeast or sugar or flour or wine or some other component. So some of those um, baits are really depending upon the recommendation that each state might give and or if that bait is gonna be used in a grower situation or if it's gonna be used in a research situation. So those different types of baits will all be shuffled around based on those factors. What you wanna keep in mind is that there really is no perfect bait. All these baits sort of have pros and cons to them in terms of how early they trap uh, insects, some will, be, will trap earlier than others. The specificity, you know, what is the attraction of just the spot of wing, just the target we're after uh, versus non-targets, and then how easy are they to actually use, the convenience factor. So we are uh, looking at all those as we make our determination of what bait that we're going to use. The last component is the drowning solution, and this is actually what captures um, and drowns the insects uh, that come into the trap. Okay, there is no toxicant in this, in this trap whatsoever. So the insects fly in, uh, they contact the drowning solution, and then they, uh, they eventually uh, do drown. That solution can be anything from water to 25 to 100% apple cider vinegar. It really just does depend on the function uh, of that liquid. Um, what's really important though is that we put in at least a drop of this um, unscented uh, dish soap. And what that does is help break the surface tension of the water so that when insects actually do contact that liquid, they're drawn into the liquid and uh, aren't able to walk around on top of it. The yellow arrow here at the bottom kind of shows you, you know, there's about an inch or so in the bottom of that container and that's, uh, that's the actual drying solution. So in terms of our recommendations uh, for the trap, we use the Sentry uh, SWD trap and that costs about $8 new. The bait that we recommend is the Sentry Lure and those are about $6 a piece. We've used that, those two combinations of trap and bait for the past two years and we'll use them again this year. Uh, we find that the, that particular bait is uh, more attractive 
and a bit earlier than just apple cider vinegar and fairly convenient to use. Uh, the question is, is it more specific? Meaning does it just attract spotted wing? And unfortunately the answer is no, it does attract a lot of other non-targets as well. And so we have to sort of deal with that. Uh, the bait itself lasts about four weeks. And if we have any uh, lures that we're just sort of holding for the summer, we want to keep those in the refrigerator. And then the last piece is going to be the drowning solution. We recommend about a 25% solution of apple cider vinegar. And again, don't forget uh, to add that drop of uh, unscented dish soap. And you're going to service these traps weekly and change out that drowning solution weekly. This is a slide I wanted to show you that, that sort of talks about the bait type, um, how specific it might be to spot a wing and, and other non-target insects. So what we have here are vials. Uh, each one of these vials is the contents uh, that was in one particular uh, uh, sentry trap. Uh, for those vials that have an SC above them, that means those contents all came from a trap baited with the sentry lure. For those vials with an A above them, those are sentry traps that were baited with apple cider vinegar. And what I want you to look at is how much more stuff is in those vials with the sentry lure than those vials that came from just uh, apple cider vinegar uh, baited traps. Uh, so um, what this means is yes, we're a little bit earlier, which is great for detection. Uh, we might actually catch a few more spotted wings, which is great, but we have to also sort through a lot more stuff, which is kind of the, um, the unfortunate part of that particular trade-off. So I just want to show you that there is a difference between using these different baits. They really do attract insects differently. Moving on to uh, trap deployment, our basic rule of thumb is uh, two traps per crop per acre. And uh, we wanna place one of those traps at the edge of the field uh, by a woods if it's present, and then one more toward the interior of the field. From recent studies, we know that the spotted wing adults can move at least 150 meters, you know, maybe more. So that kind of gives you an idea of their uh, mobility. So in this little example on the, on the right-hand side, you see a woods, you see a one acre blueberry field, you see one trap toward the edge of the field and then one trap more toward the interior. If we were to expand that and make that a two acre blueberry field, now you see there's two traps to the perimeter and two traps to the interior, okay? Uh, suppose we're looking at kind of a diversified farm operation where we have raspberries and blueberries and grapes, which are all susceptible to spot a wing all in the same farm. You know, how do we go ahead and trap this? Well, that raspberry field is three acres, which would mean that we would need to put in six traps. Again, several around the perimeter and several in the interior. Now, this is gonna be the earliest ripening fruit on, uh, on this farm, supposedly. So we would expect to find the spot of wing here first. But if we don't find it here, then we're gonna go ahead and move over to our blueberry field, put some traps up there, see if we detect it there. And if not, we'll finish up with our late fruit, late season fruit, which would be the grapes. Um, one thing Celeste and I have been talking about is these general strategies about, you know, if you were to find it in the raspberry field, chances are very high that you would not have to necessarily trap in the blueberry field once those blueberries became ripe and ripening the spotted wing would migrate from the raspberry field over to the blueberry field. And then depending upon the distance of the blueberry to the grapes, they might eventually get to the grape uh, vineyard as well. So once you have spotted wing on a farm, you could almost uh, assume that it's gonna be in all of those susceptible crops. The first or second year maybe that you're doing this, just to verify that, you may wanna hang some traps up in those other crops, you know, verify that you're catching spotted wing and then implement management procedures as needed. Uh, but our experience has been that once it gets into one crop, it tends to migrate through a farm to all those other susceptible crops. Here's an aerial shot of one of the fields that we actually do monitor. You can see there's woods along the, uh, the left edge there and along the bottom. The blue rectangle represents the blueberry field, both early maturing uh, at the top end and then late maturing at the bottom end. The black rectangle are actually blackberries and the red rectangle is actually raspberries. So if this was one of your growers fields, I want you to think about where would you 
want to put these traps so that you had the best chance of catching a spotted wing. And so what I would recommend is uh, put a trap or two in the blueberry field, maybe toward the top end uh, where the early maturing blueberries are. Again, one toward the edge, maybe one toward the interior. You could just as easily put one toward the bottom of that blueberry field where that woods is just to catch them coming out of the woods and migrating into the field. The earliest maturing fruit at this location is the raspberries, that's the red rectangle. So I would put one or two traps there as well. So if you're thinking about you know, how to position the traps, you wanna be thinking about all these variables, earliness of ripening and location of the woods and then just sort of make your best judgment at that point in time. Let's talk about trap deployment actually inside the field. We wanna place those traps out in the canopy about two to three weeks uh, prior to the fruit ripening. We wanna definitely get those traps out before the fruit ripens. Um, and we're gonna to wanna to put that right where those flower clusters and fruit clusters are going to be. So if you're thinking about raspberries as the crop, early in the season, they tend to have fairly weak, uh, weak canes. And so if you were to put this trap on a cane, it would probably weigh it over. It, it wouldn't be able to support the weight. So I bought a simple shepherd's hook, stuck it in the ground, and then put that trap right in the canopy. You can see the fruit and the flower clusters are all around. Uh, that's where it needs to be to be functional. Uh, on the right, you see uh, a vineyard and I've got the trap right in there with the vines, you know, right next to the, to the grapes. And that's sort of how you want to position that as well. So regardless of the, crop, of, of, of the crop, you want to put that trap right in where the fruit is going to be. Okay, so what about the deployment rules in terms of if you're a grower or if, you, if you're a research cooperator? Really, if you're a grower, after you get that first detection, you know, you can remove those traps and then based on your fruit ripeness, you can initiate your management program. Um, your basic job with the trap is to detect if spotted weed can come into that field. Once you've done that, then the trap's job is really over. If you're a research cooperator, so an extension educator who's putting these traps out for a grower, um, really after your first detection, that's, that's great. You, know, you want to communicate that to the grower, but then we would like you to keep monitoring because we want to try to figure out what these populations are doing throughout the season. And so um, for you, that season might be June through August or June through September. Uh, it just depends on you know, how long <clears throat> you're able to go and, and what the crop is doing. If you're pressed for time and you can't you know, afford the time to identify the samples every week, we would still ask that you collect those samples um, and just uh, you know, label them properly. And then at some point in time, you can send those samples to us. We can go through and identify and figure out the spot wing populations week by week. So uh, keep collecting if you can, uh, but you don't have to, to do the identification piece. And uh, we'll do that for you later on. OK, so now we're going to move on to uh, the part about had the trap out in the field. And now we need to take the contents and move that over into a vial, which we could then take inside under the microscope. And so all these videos that I'm gonna show you are on the OSU IPM YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and you just type in OSU IPM in the search box, you're gonna to come to where all of these videos are. There's a whole playlist of them just for spot and wing. And so that, that'll be the category that you wanna search for. So, um, Right now, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this particular screen. Okay, this is a video that I wanna show you about um, how to go ahead and uh, take those trap captures over into the vial. So let's just take five minutes and watch this. Hello there, my name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with Ohio State University Extension, the Integrated Management Program. And today I wanna to talk to you more about spot wing drosophila management. So in other videos, we've talked about how to set up the traps and put them in the field. In other videos, we've shown you how to do saltwater testing for larvae and the fruit. But this video is gonna concentrate on what happens in between. Once you've actually had a trap out in the field for a week and you've got some insects in there, how to go ahead and transfer them over to a vial that you're gonna take inside and put under your microscope to actually look for the males and the
There's no audio. Yeah, Jim, we, we had audio at the beginning. Of where the trap came from. Can you hear it now? A future reference. You'll need yep. a small paintbrush, okay. um, a little strainer to actually catch the insects as they come out of the liquid. And if you're going to be, uh, and of course, uh, some, some vials and uh, the labels either on the top or on the side. And if you're going to be doing, you know, a uh, number of these traps uh, in any season, you might want to make yourself up a little jig out of styrofoam where the vials set down inside of there. They're much easier to transport and much more stable when you're pouring um, the contents of the trap uh, into them. So that's just something you want to, might want to make up. As you can see, there's a lot of small parts and pieces here. And if you're going to do a number of these sites a year, you might think about getting one of these larger totes and putting all the goodies inside the tote and that way you can carry them around uh, really quite easily. So let's get back to the nuts and bolts of, of how we're going to do this. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to uh, take uh, the contents of this trap right here and we're going to transfer it into uh, this vial right here. So let me make some space here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find where the label's at or put the label on. I'm gonna mark my name, the date, the location, uh, the crop, and any identifier I need for the trap. That's very important, okay? Got having that done, I'm gonna go ahead and take the top off, set that in this little jig, put the cap down. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and take the waste jug, open up the top on that, take the funnel, put it right inside there, put the strainer right inside the funnel. I'm gonna to go to my trap, I'm gonna take the top off. If I was outside, I would actually just go ahead and hang this in the bush or on the vine so it's not on the ground. Um, inside, you're gonna see the insects that are trapped. And what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and swirl this around, get everything suspended. And you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to where these black holes are in the trap. Uh, if you pour through one of those, you're gonna strain out some insects and it's gonna be difficult for you to catch everything. So when you're pouring, make sure you're pouring from this, this flat spot on the back. So give all those a little bit of a swirl, pour them right through the strainer, right into the waste jug. Okay. And now you can put that strainer right inside there, no big deal. Now you wanna look inside the trap itself to make sure there's no insects that are, haven't gotten poured out. If you see a couple, just go ahead and get the paintbrush, grab them and then transfer them over, grab a few more, transfer over to the strainer, and you're good to go. Trap gets set down. Now at this point, all of the insects are here inside the strainer. We need to get those inside the vial. So we're gonna go ahead and take the funnel, put it right inside the container, go ahead and give that a couple of healthy shakes, and about 90, 95% of the insects should come off, but if not, take your paintbrush again, grab those few and transfer them over, okay, into the funnel. Having done that, you can go ahead and put the strainer down. Now you're gonna have all the insects that are gonna be sort of on the rim of the funnel. We need to wash those down into the vial proper. So we take our squeeze bottle and you don't have a lot, you have about 20 mils to play with, so be very uh, efficient with how you squirt these down, but just down the sides, down the sides, in the middle until they're all gone, okay. Set that down, take off the funnel, put him there, put the top on. And then when you're all set, you're gonna have something that looks like this. So all of the insects are in the bottom of the liquids around the side of it, okay? Now you're not quite done. You wanna take your 25% apple cider vinegar, your drowning solution, pour it back into the trap. Go ahead and take the top of the trap, put it right back on, tighten it up, and hang it back in the bush. Okay. If you have any questions, please let me know. I wish you good luck. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I didn't realize if I muted my uh, volume that it was gonna mute the volume on the video as well, but that's something we learn as we go through this process. So that's kind of the basics of how to take um, the insects that are inside the trap and then go ahead and move them over into the vials. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the next step, which is, okay, now we have everything in the vial. Now we need to move that over into a Petri dish or some way to sort those under a microscope. Uh, a few slides here I wanna mention is that 
after we, uh, you know, we put these traps out for about a week and then we would collect uh, uh, the insects that are trapped. And we have about 24 to 48 hours after we collect those that we'd like you to go through those and figure out is there spotted wing in that sample or not, and then report that. So that's something that's, um, you just wanna you know, try to get up front so you don't end up stacking these up weeks and weeks and then you know, go through them on some Saturday afternoon. Uh, and that information is really relevant to the growers. So the quicker we get that out, the better we get out. Um, so what is, what's gonna be in these traps? Well, we're gonna have spotted wing drosophila adults, obviously both the males and the females. We're gonna have other insects that look like spotted wing, about the same size, same shape, other vinegar flies, other drosophila type flies. Uh, some of them might have markings on the wing, so just having the spot by itself doesn't actually mean that it's a spotted wing. And then there's going to be a bunch of things in there that are, are the non-targets, other types of flies or wasps or moths or beetles or even spiders get in there. So those things we can rule out pretty easily, but they are going to be biomass to have to sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort, sort, sort through and, and go around. Um, the trap catch is going to fluctuate with the season. It's going to really tend to increase you know, more toward the middle and end of the season. And when you put a new lure out, a lot of times you're gonna go ahead and get an additional, you know, bump in the trap catch as well. So we've already talked about this a little bit, but the things we wanna be focused on and highlighting is on the males, we wanna be looking for that spot on the wing and those two um, sort of rows of, of combs or hairs on the front leg only. For the female, kind of has a golden body, has these continuous stripes that uh, run across the back of the abdomen, and then this great big ovipositor that's back here. And Celeste showed you some great pictures showing the teeth that are on the ovipositor. So those are all things that we're gonna sort of try to keep in our mind and play this, you know, where's Waldo game as we go through the sample and try to find the males and the females based on those characters. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and, and try to, uh, show you the sorting video, which uh, is not actually the video that's, that's shown here, but let me um, escape this for a second. And we'll go to the sorting video and we'll go ahead and play that. And today I wanna to share with you some tips and tricks I've learned over the years for sorting and separating out adult spotted wing drosophila, both the males and the females. So by now you've probably taken the trap contents uh, outside and dumped them into a vial like this and now we have to take the contents of this vial and put them into a petri dish, to put them under the scope, to be able to look for both the male and female spotted wing versus all the other non-targets that might be in there. So what do we need to do to get started? First things we're gonna to need to have something like a petri dish to put uh, the contents of the vial into, and then something like this, which is a target or a grid, that's gonna help you sort and separate more efficiently. You'll be able to go up and down the lines um, of this chart and not be able to uh, miss any areas or double count any areas. Typically, we put this target right behind uh, the Petri dish, just like this, and then count typically one quadrant at a time. An example I'm gonna show you in a few minutes, I'm only gonna count one quadrant, but if I was doing the entire dish, I would go through all uh, those four quadrants and repeat the process. Uh, something you might wanna think about doing is taping this quadrant to the back of the Petri dish, therefore the two can't move and you can't lose your place. So, uh, what else do we need? Something to move around uh, the samples. So you might have something like a pair of forceps, might have a paintbrush, some uh, type of uh, plastic pick, or even something as simple as uh, like a plastic tie wrap might help you move the samples around if they're not in perfect position for you to identify them. Uh, so I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and get started. So we'll take our sample, we'll take our Petri dish, the swirl, Dump it in, and then start counting. If you think of the Petri dish as a clock, I'm starting at 12 noon and working my way sort of right to left in the upper left quadrant. I'm panning back and forth. I think this is a female. I'm zooming in a bit more. I really want to focus on that ovipositor. You can see now the teeth of the ovipositor. That confirms that that is a female spotted drosophila. Continue searching right to left. Go down a grid, all the way to the edge. Work my way back to the right. I see something suspicious here. As I zoom in, 
that looks like a female. And the teeth on the ovipositor confirms that as a female. Zoom back out a little bit. Right now my field of view is about one centimeter wide. You see something you're not sure of? Take your brush out, give it a poke, put it in a better position to determine if it is a male or a female, and then move on. Here, we have both a female at the top, it looks like a male at the bottom. Yep, that's a female. Note the teeth on the ovipositor, spots on the wings. Now we have to try to find those two spurs on the front leg. Can't quite see it there. Give it a push. Now you can see those two spurs. That is a male. I continue searching. There's the boundary of the first quadrant. Now I move down. In this frame, I can see a female on the right and a male at the bottom and a male at the top. Give it a poke, take a look. At the top, you'll see those two spurs on the front leg. Definitely a male. Keep looking. Up at the top is a female. Down at the bottom is a female. It looks like there's another male right there in the bottom center. Right there, yep. We'll zoom in, look at that front leg, you see those two spurs, those two cones of hairs. Here we see another female on the left. Note the ovipositor has the teeth. Note the general golden color of the body and the stripes that go all the way across the abdomen. Moving down, the edge of the petri dish. There's a male in the center. There's another male in the center. The female in the center, there's a male at the bottom right. Zoom in, you see the teeth on the ovipositor, confirms as a female. A male to her left. Next to that needle, that's a female on the left, yep, right there. That's a male on the right. So a female there, and that beetle, and the male's on the right. There's a male that's straggling that yellow line. If you have a male or female that's on a line, go ahead and move it one way or the other. Just make a rule of how you want to count those. Follow it. As we move to the red line, this ends our search of the first quadrant. Okay, <clears throat> so that uh, shows you how to kind of go through and manipulate the microscope sample left and right, zoom in on the females and the males, confirm those characters that we talked about. Can I, can I make one little comment, Jim? Certainly. That um, I think that was a really good um, learning uh, type of dish for learning this. We saw a lot of good examples, but everybody should keep in mind that that early that type of sample would be probably typical of later in the summer. And for you guys, when you're having your early season samples, it'll probably be more like you search, 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 and you know you might be finding nothing, or you might find just a single SWD in the whole dish. So just keep that in mind that you won't be finding lots and lots like Jim just showed in that particular sample. Right, and the other thing I want to mention is that you know there were a couple males and females that were in that video that I didn't necessarily point out. So um, if you thought you may have saw a male or female that I didn't point out, you were probably correct. I didn't show you every one, but I just tried to show you 
very obvious males and females, and then as I went through and narrated. So uh, just to get that out of the way. All right, so let's go back and uh, finish up my section here, and then we'll uh, hand it over to Celeste. Okay, so the last part I want to talk to you about is the saltwater testing, where is, which is where we look for the larvae in the fruit. This is also called the maggot monitoring, and you know, Celeste is in love with the word maggot, but I just, I love to use it here anyway. It's kind of fun. Um, and really, the purpose of the saltwater test is to evaluate this, the spray program. That's why we're doing it. We're seeing, you know, how well we're covering the fruit and how well we're controlling the, the adults. Uh, generally, we're going to want to, you know, make that test just about weekly uh, on ripe fruit. Uh, we're going to want to record those larvae levels. Just know that the infestation levels of the larvae might go up and down, you know, based on weather, based on insecticide use. Uh, the spray intervals that you might have, how well your sprayer is functioning, if a nozzle plugs up, something like that. So these things all affect uh, potentially what you see in terms of the, the overall spray efficacy. As a general rule too, if you, you know, pick this fruit and you're not sure of the quality of it, you might want to refrigerate it. Uh, refrigeration does seem to slow down the development. It can actually kill some of the eggs and some of the smaller instars. So now I'm going to go ahead and transfer you over to my last video, which is how to do uh, an actual saltwater test. My name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with Ohio State University Extension, the Integrated Pest Management Program. And today I'm going to talk to you more about spotted wing drosophila management. Now in prior videos, we've talked about how to set traps up. We've talked about how to empty those traps and how to identify the male and female spotted wing that might be in that sample. And today we're going to take a look at what happens after you've been in the season for a few weeks, you've been spraying for a few weeks, and maybe you want to check to see how well your spray program is doing. One of the ways that we do that is we actually look at the fruit to see if there's any spotted wing larvae in the fruit. That's going to be a measure of how well your spray program is doing. So what do we need to get started with? Well, we're going to need some of that fruit that you've picked from your patch or from your vineyard, whatever the small fruit might be. We're going to need some water, measuring cup. We're going to need a canister to put all this together in. Uh, early on, we used to use Ziploc bags. And Ziploc bags are great and easy to get, except when you put a sample in there that might fall over and the contents might leak out. We then went to these taller quart size containers, which are great because they can't tip over, but because they're tall, all the fruit kind of stacks up on itself, and sometimes that might trap the larvae beneath there. So we've kind of moved away from using these taller quart cylinders, and now we're using these more flat design. And so all the contents, the fruit and the salt water is gonna go inside of here. Now the fruit's still gonna float up, so to try to keep that fruit down and separate the larvae that come up, we're gonna use something like this. This is a piece of hardware cloth. Uh, that's about a quarter inch in terms of mesh size. And once we put the fruit and the salt water in here, we'll put this on top, and that'll actually weigh down the fruit and help separate out the larvae. Moving on, we're gonna need some regular table salt. We'll need a measuring spoon, and maybe something like some measuring cups, and that'll come into uh, play when we talk about the fruit. And then uh, either a spoon to mix with, or maybe even a potato masher, and I'll talk about what that could be used for uh, just here briefly. So the first step is to figure out how many berries we're going to use. Typically for raspberries or blackberries, we would just pick a number anywhere from 25 to 75. Uh, when you have blueberries, it tend to be a little bit smaller, so I just go by the amount that I have. So if I want a cup or a half a cup or something like that, just whatever you decide on, just be consistent so that you have some idea relative every time you do the saltwater test as to how many larvae are actually being floated. Here I've got some blueberries. Instead of counting them out, I'm gonna just put in a cup roughly. So I'm gonna sprinkle these in here. So that's more or less a cup right there. Okay, we'll just go ahead and dump those right in. Uh, and now comes the chance to add the salt water. The salt water actually irritates the larvae and drives them out of the fruit if they're in there. The secret formula is for every eight ounces of water or every cup of water, one tablespoon of salt. So you're gonna need around 24 to 32 ounces of liquid for every sample that you do. So we're gonna pour out 32 ounces of water right here. That should do it. And that's gonna be the equivalent of four tablespoons of salt. So here's my tablespoon measure. Here's the salt. So it goes in. There's one. And there's four. Okay. 
So if the water is slightly warm, that's okay because it helps dissolve the salt a little bit quicker, but don't use hot water because that might kill the larvae and prevent them from actually swimming out of the fruit and into the liquid and then floating up to the top. So we give it a quick stir. We're gonna go ahead and add some water. We'll put our screen on top of there to help weigh those fruit down. Okay, that should be about good. So a couple of the blueberries have escaped around the side, but primarily everything is in here. You're gonna want about uh, an inch or so of headspace between the fruit and the top of the liquid. That metal screen really does help press the fruit down, let the larvae float up. So now we're gonna go ahead and wait for about 10 to 15 minutes and let the salt water do its magic. And we'll come back and we'll take a look and see if there's anything in here. This is an overhead shot of the blueberries and salt water mixture. If there were any larvae, they would be floating in the top of the water. The larvae are translucent or whitish in color and no larger than a grain of rice. In this next photo, you can see arrows pointing towards second and third instar larvae. In the next photo, you see raspberries that also have larvae floated out of them. In the final photo, you see again raspberries that are very heavily infested with the spotted wing larvae. So even though we looked and didn't find any spotted wing larvae, that's okay. That tells us that these store-bought fruit are perfectly clean. In addition to using salt water, some tests require or use sugar water. The advantage is in the sugar water, it does not kill the larvae in case you decide to rear them into adulthood for positive identification. Something else I wanted to show you was we talked about using the more taller container if you have those around. And then I talked about the potato masher. Now, if you don't have a screen like I use for this uh, more flat container, use a smaller potato masher to gently push down the berries inside the container. Don't crush them because if you crush them, you're going to have a lot of small pieces to try to sort through to try to find the larvae. Just use it again to push the berries down into the liquid and see if the larvae are floating up on top. So that's it. That's the basic steps of doing a saltwater test to try to determine if there are spotted wing drosophila larvae in your fruit. I hope this video was helpful to you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, so that was the uh, five minute or six minute video on how to do the saltwater test and what it's really trying to, to show you, its function. So hopefully you, you pick that up. I just have a few concluding slides and then I'm gonna hand it over to Celeste to, to take us home. So basically, um, what's really important to take away from here is the berry selection is really important. You really wanna focus on picking healthy fruit. You don't wanna pick fruit that looks like it's been damaged somehow because there are other insects that might infest that fruit that if you float them in the salt water, uh, you might get sort of a false reading of how many spotted wing are actually in that crop. So. Pick those fruit from the top, the middle, and the bottom of the plants. Pick those fruit in various locations around the field. Um, and try to avoid uh, the ends of the rows where you might be turning on or off the sprayer. Uh, in the pictures here, I've got diagrammed. If you're talking about raspberries, some things to be paying attention to. The picture on the left shows bad fruit. Uh, when the fruit begins to separate away from the cap like that, that area that's right in here, that is something you want to avoid. In this composite picture over on the right, you see a combination of bad fruit and good fruit all in the same cluster. So pick the good, skip the bad. I just want to again show you pictures of what the larvae look like. Again, small, sort of a translucent, almost you know, grain size, a rice grain size or smaller. Um, you can see where there's no larvae floating in this liquid, and you have to look pretty carefully when there's a low low population to, to try to find them. Typically they get attracted to the edge of the container so look at that area very closely. Here we see kind of a low infestation. If you have this uh, then I think it's still okay to sell this fruit. Uh, you may want to refrigerate it. You may want to be paying attention to your spray program and your spray interval. Uh, if you get a situation like this where you've got you know hundreds of larvae this is a situation where I don't think you're going to want to sell this fruit. Uh, you're definitely going to want to look at modifying your spray program, your chemical selection. Maybe you've got issues with your spray equipment. These are all things to be double checking. Okay, so that's it for my section. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Celeste go ahead and take us home.
All right, so um, this piece is about the management tactics that we can suggest. Now, I realize a lot of the people attending today are going to be mainly doing the trapping if you're not growing fruit yourself. But we just want everyone to be aware of uh, what management tactics are out there so that you could share this with the growers. Um, so I will go over a few not, of course, a lot of growers are trying to grow these without chemicals. So I'll mention where we stand with some cultural, mechanical, biological controls, but then go into quite a bit of detail on chemical, which is what most growers are using right now. For a cultural control, prompt harvest is extremely important. Harvesting as soon as ripe, not just the good berries, but the bad berries as well. Uh, some growers have, their pickers have two different buckets, you know, a bucket for the good and a bucket for the bad. There's been some recent work about canopy management, particularly the role of pruning. Uh, so what you can see in the pictures here, like uh, on the left, uh, a not well pruned uh, bush in the middle, sort of moderately pruned, and then over on the right, a heavily pruned bush. What has been found so far is that the heavier pruning does help. It makes the canopy less hospitable for spotted wing than if you have a lightly pruned and it also allows better spray coverage, but the big downside is it does seem to, to end up with lower yield. So, uh, you know, like many cultural controls, they have both um, a pro and a con. Another cultural control that's being investigated recently is crop floor management. The idea is we need, if we can possibly prevent larvae from burrowing into the soil to pupate, um, break their life cycle that way, that might help. So these studies have been done to look at the effect of mulch on spotted wing survival. And what's been found so far is that looser type mulches, such as wood chips, um, generally favor the spotted wing. Um, the spotted wing survival is generally higher below. They can go through the mulch and they survive well underneath. If they just stay on top, they don't survive well. But what has, is uh, showing more promise is the black weed mat, you know, that tightly woven fabric type of weed mat that leads to higher temperature and fewer spotted wings surviving. So there, that is a possible tactic for the organic growers who are really trying cultural controls. A sadder, the final cultural control is rather sad, just suggests people might wanna change crops. Some growers just do not want to be doing all the spraying. So keep in mind that thus far, the crops that seem to be least affected by spotted wing are the June bearing strawberries and black raspberries. The spotted wing definitely does like black raspberries, but usually the raspberry, black raspberry harvest season is just finishing when spotted wing are starting to appear. And moving to mechanical controls, um, sanitation is, is very important. You know, if you're um, picking the fruit very regularly, um, the idea is to destroy all leftover fruit, all of those cold fruit. Don't just throw them in a compost pile. It's good to do this every two days. If you do it less frequently, it is not as effective. Um, in terms of what to do with the calls, studies are finding that putting them in clear plastic bags and leaving them in the sun for a week seems to be the best approach. The key thing though is, or you can, if you bury them, it's supposed to be two feet deep, which most people aren't willing to do, but just mere composting is not adequate. Another mechanical control is by chilling, chilling the fruit as soon as it's harvested. Of course, this applies to the slightly less perishable fruits like blueberry. Um, but if you can keep them at 33, 34 degrees, that can be helpful. Uh, a lot of people have been looking at mechanical control by netting as a tactic, again, primarily for organic growers. It is feasible, but it takes a lot of planning. Uh, you have to figure out what you're going to do about pollinators as well as all other crop operations under the net. But some nice studies have been done in New York and Michigan and Arkansas, and we have um, links to those different studies available if anyone is interested. I also visited a farm up in um, North Central Ohio where one of the growers has recently enclosed, um, I believe it was a blackberry planting in netting, and it looks very, very nice. He has like a a double or a triple doorway, it's very important to really secure the, the entry into these netted areas. Another mechanical control that is quite challenging, but the idea to try and remove nearby, wi nearby wild hosts. There are many different wild hosts, things like wild blackberries, pokeweed, mock strawberry, various kinds of honeysuckle, dogwood, persimmon, rose hips. 
so this is quite a tall order, but that can contribute to um, a reduction in spotted wing. A lot of growers are asking what's the story with biocontrol. Uh, what we know so far is our native natural enemies are not doing much at all to help um, with this pest. Only about 2% of the spotted wing population is parasitized, and that is primarily by some pupil parasitoids. So as shown here, this is a, a tiny little wasp laying an egg inside the spotted wing pupa. Uh, the spotted wing seems to know how to encapsulate some of those parasitoids. So even though it was parasitized, the parasitoid does not succeed in killing the insect. Uh, there's been a lot of entomological explorations recently in Korea, China. Five different parasitoids have been identified and are under study in quarantine at Berkeley. So we're hoping that in the future, we, uh, some of these will be allowed uh, for release and will really help um, with some other tactics available to us. In the meantime, some recent studies on predatory insects were done in Michigan. Uh, looking at what attacks the larvae of spotted wing and what attacks the pupae of spotted wing. They found it's things like ants, spiders, and rove beetles attacking the larvae. Also, harvestmen, centipedes, earwigs attack the pupae. So they are contributing some, but they don't seem to be doing a very thorough job. So then that leaves the big topic of chemical tactics. Here are some of the um, decisions I'll talk about are when to start spraying, what products to spray, and how often to spray. The factors that can affect these decisions are things like how often the crop is harvested. Of course, with crops like raspberries, they're harvested very frequently, not daily. Um, the pre-harvest interval and how long the residue is active. In terms of when to start spraying, the basic rule is that the adult flies are detected. So that's where all that stuff Jim went into about how to trap is very important when you get that first detect positive detection of the spotted wing. And if the farm has fruit that started to turn color, which at this point is our best rule of thumb for the fruit being susceptible to injury. So if you have those two, thing, those two um, things happening, then it's time to start the spray schedule. In terms of what to spray, we have a lot of different choices. Um, shown here, ranked from the most effective down to just slightly effective in different groups of products. Um, and these are some of the names of the actual products. Notice for organic growers, uh, Entrust is the most effective, um, but we do have a few other choices now. Grandivo, Venerate seem to be working. In terms of home gardens, I didn't list the actual names, but in many of those same groups of products, we do have a home garden equivalent. Uh, in some of those cases, we don't have a home garden equivalent. And there is a handout on my website with more details about those products. For high tunnels, um, we're having a lot of problems with spotted wing and high tunnels in the autumn. And just beware that they have slightly different rules. We consider high tunnels to be a greenhouse. Some labels specifically allow products to be used in the greenhouse, such as malathion. Some labels prohibit use in greenhouse. And really note, this includes some of our products that really are used for spotted wing. Delegate, Radiant um, are very good spotted wing products, but they're not allowed in the greenhouse. La the labels are silent on greenhouse use for a lot of other products. We interpret that as they are okay to use. That's all the different pyrethroids, as well as lanate, imidan, and interest. In terms of what time of day to spray, we do know that spotted wing flies are most active in early morning and evening when it's cooler out. We think it's best to spray in the evening to minimize bee effects because we know in the early morning, the bees are usually really out and active. Then the next question, how often to spray? Well, the general rule is when the residues are no longer active. Um, and that depends on the product. A good general rule is seven days. Most of the products last about seven days, but some products like XRL and Delegate are just slightly shorter than that. All the pyrethroids are a little bit longer than that. So that's summarized in this chart. And then um, in the handout, I'll mention later, this information is in there. Now, how many sprays total? This is a really important question. It depends on the product. These days, almost all products do have limits and they are expressed as either an amount of product total for the year and or a number of sprays. But make sure you understand there is an interaction between these two things. For example, the delegate label says you're allowed to spray it six times, but it also says you're only allowed to use 19 ounces of product. And if you're using up to um, 
six ounces per spray, the maximum rate, then you're actually only allowed to spray it three times at that high rate, not six times. So again, we have sort of digested all of this information and, and have it summarized in a table that growers have found useful. So again, here's just an example of maximum number of sprays for raspberries. The three main insecticides that are being used are Delegate, Mustang Max, and Malathion. They're being used because they all have a one-day pre-harvest interval. But Delegate can be used three times at the maximum rate, Mustang Max six times, Malathion three times. There are other products allowed on raspberries, Danitol, Brigade, and Hero, but because they have a three-day PHI, they really are not used much. They are each allowed to be used twice. And then in Trust is just different because that's primarily uh, used by the organic growers. It does have a one day. You're allowed to use it four times, but only twice in a row. Then you have to alternate with something else before you use it the other two times. So the idea is the growers really should try and plan out at the beginning of the year what scenario they think they'll follow if they do detect spotted wing. There's been some work about whether feeding stimulants can help these products perform better, particularly the organic products that are not quite as effective. So the idea is uh, that the spotted wing have receptors in their feet that detect sweetness. So if we could mix something like sugar or sugar and yeast in with the pesticide, then that might um, result in you know, better contact of the bug with the poison and therefore better mortality. So a bunch of studies were done with sucrose, just simple table sugar, some studies uh, in the Northeast back in 2012 and 13 with table sugar, they were assuming 50 gallons of water per acre, and then they were using a pound of sugar in that 50 gallons of water. And the results seem to show that if they were using Entrust, Delegate, or XRL, that did seem to give them somewhat better control, maybe 10 to 20 percent improved mortality. Some more recent studies were done in Georgia with this, uh, and some of their results showed that just plain sugar added with Entrust did make it somewhat longer lasting, and that if they tried sugar plus yeast, that was no better than sugar alone. Then there, there's been interest in other adjuvants. Some organic growers are concerned that sugar might be also attracting some beneficials such as um, bees, and they don't want them to be harmed. So um, there have been some studies to evaluate silicone surfactants. Um, these two listed here are specifically allowed on organic farms, leaf life widespread, and new film tea. But the trials on these recently have not been very conclusive. The results varied by insecticide. Some were helped, some were not. And the results weren't consistent from year to year. So at this point, we're not particularly enthused about these, but some organic growers might want to use them, just trying to get every little bit they can out of the um, products they're using. So in summary of how we're managing spotted wing on brambles, um, number one, use the bait traps, check them weekly, as Jim went over. If any SWD are found in the trap, start a spray program. If the berries are starting to turn color, spray until final harvest. And then um, the details at the bottom, that spray will be every seven days with most conventional products such as Delegate and Mustang, or every five days with the organic products such as Entrust and Grandivo. And then with those, you also have the, the option of maybe adding sugar. Step number three, then do that salt test with right fruit weekly to see if your program is working. And if you are getting some larvae in that salt test, you might decide to spray more often, tighten up your interval if you're finding that your control is not good enough. Here is a chart that's available in one of our handouts. The idea is to just see it's a list of products going down the rows and a list of crops going across the top, the seven most important crops. And then the, this just shows the pre-harvest interval. It's all over the place, so you cannot assume if you know, for example, delegate how it's used on raspberries, don't assume it's the same on the other crops. It really does vary from crop to crop. This also has a designation of whether or not it's allowed in greenhouses or high tunnels, and whether it's on the OMRI list and also the residual activity in dates. But the one thing we couldn't quite fit on that list was the number of sprays allowed. So we have a separate chart that is just showing the number of applications allowed if you're assuming the maximum rate of product is used. So it does have that conservative twist to it. So those are available on a website. One other note about chemical control is whether or not border sprays might work. Um, it's been found that they can be adequate early in the season when spotted wing is just starting up. Um, because 
based on studies of spotted wing behavior, it's been found that if you have a low pressure population of spotted wing, they generally do more damage near the edge of the field. And they also do more damage lower in the canopy on those plants at the edge of the field. Once spotted wing really gets going and develops into a high pressure population, then it changes. The damage does go across to the center of the field and you do have damage higher up in the canopy. But the idea of the border sprays, it might be a good tactic for early in the season. Finally, just some notes about resources, some basic information, those charts I just mentioned, um, information about biology and management is found on my website with the URL shown there. Then the, um, those wonderful YouTube videos that Jim showed us are available on his website with the URL shown there. And that is my last slide. We, of course, do welcome you um, anytime in the coming weeks uh, if you have questions to contact us by email or by phone. So I believe that's the last um, slide. I will stop sharing my screen. Yeah, that was, uh, that was great, Celeste. Thanks. So um, we're going to transition now into the chat box and see what questions people had. Lee Beers had to jump off a few minutes ago. And so we will see what the questions are. Okay. Um, let's see. It says, I have done trapping in Maine. Will you be providing a short one page protocol on how you would like trapping to be conducted in Ohio? This webinar looks to be a review of information I already know. Um, so basically, I was not going to prepare a one pager. We did the webinar instead, thinking that if we showed you that would be great. But basically, it's um, trapping from early June, you know, through August or September, two traps per crop of your choice, um, changed weekly and then reported weekly. That's the basic protocol. We're going to give you all the monitoring uh, bits and pieces, supply this, supplies that you might need. So hopefully that, uh, that works out uh, okay. Um, there's another question here. Uh, does the beta trap uh, draw SWD into the crop that might not have been there to begin with because of the scent? Celeste, do you want to take a whack at that or do you want me? Why don't you go ahead? So this is, this is what I can tell you based on studies that have been done. Where they hang traps in bushes or in vineyards or wherever, they actually find more damage by the trap than away from the trap. So um, you know, in one sense, I think you're possibly going to experience a little bit more damage right in that immediate area. But in the larger sense, if those spotted wing are in the area, I think they're going to migrate over and find your crop. I mean, that is their food supply. That is their job to, to find it. So uh, I think the threat of you hanging a few traps in your field and drawing those insects over is, is pretty small compared to them actually finding it as a function of their, of their surviving. Do you want to add anything to that, Celeste? Uh, not really. I think that's a good answer. I mean, the other thing we know is there, there was initially a lot of interest in what we call mass trapping. Like if these traps are so attractive, they'll just draw all the insects in and kill them. But in fact, what they're finding is that these traps really only get uh, a fairly small percentage of what's really out there. So I think knowing that makes us feel that they are not really making an increased problem. Okay. But that's a, it's a really good question. And I think it's something growers would be asking. Yeah, and actually Lee made a comment uh, that uh, basically he thinks that within a few hundred feet, um, and you know, I think we kind of agree on that, that's the trap radius attraction, so that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, the last uh, question here was, uh, was there any uh, other similar fruit flies in the video with the spotted wing? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, you know, I, I didn't go back and catalog it, but there were definitely some beetles that were in there. Those are the big dark things that were there, but pretty much everything that wasn't a beetle and it wasn't a spot of wing was probably some other kind of Drosophila or fly. Uh, I didn't really point those things out because again, I want your search pattern to really be focused on looking for spot of wing, you know, uh, the males with the spots and the spurs, the females with the golden bodies, the stripes that go around the abdomen, and those uh, teeth infested ovipositors. So that would be uh, you know, just my comment, but yes, there are definitely other Drosophila that were in there. 
Yeah, the one other thing we'll mention in your packet of stuff that, that everybody's going to get, we have a really good handout. I think it's four or five pages from Michigan State, where for each of the different features, they show what is spotted wing and what are not spotted wing, similar ones. And like there, you'll see some pictures. A lot of them, they have bands across the abdomen, but they're broken bands. With spotted wing, it's a more solid band across the top. Or, you know, the color, it's more of this golden color with spotted wing. And a lot of the non-spotted wing are more of a whitish color. So I think if you glance at that um, handout, that might give you a lot more confidence. Right. Okay. Um, well, that was all the questions that we had. So we've got about another five or 10 minutes here. We actually were pretty much on time, which is, which is great for us. <laughs> uh, so if you don't want to type your question in, if you just want to unmute your mic and then give us your question and then mute yourself again, we'll go and give you a response to the best of our ability. I mean, there was a lot of information there. And, and the reason that I chose to show you those three short videos is because it's really um, difficult to do those demonstrations with all of the other stuff that's going out the webinar. So I, I had to prep all of my stuff ahead of time and then show you where Celeste was just uh, able to just show you the slides and go through it. So I wasn't trying to cut any corners. It was just a matter of um, being able to present all that in a way that you'd be able to see it and understand it and not spill it on my laptop and cause even and more damage. So do you have any last questions about Spotted Wing, about the protocol, about how to monitor, anything with the identification? Um, the saltwater test piece of it, uh, just general comments about management, or if we get the first detection, what do we do? Um, it's, it's our assumption that the majority of you outside of Aaron are gonna be sort of titled as research cooperators, and we would like you to trap starting from June all the way through August or September if you're able. If you can't identify those samples because of time, just collect them, label them, and then, you know, uh, we might ask to have those sent to us and then we'll be able to go through them at some point in time. Um, that's just kind of a, a quick review. So do we have any questions? Carrie has one. Okay, let's see what this says here. <laughs> what did you use to make your videos? <laughs> right, um, uh, I, I used a, actually a, uh, a video camera. Uh, wireless mic, you know, um, the, uh, the tripod. Yeah, those are, those are HD quality films. Um, had that equipment for a couple years. It's, it's available for loan if you have, you know, some type of IPM project that you want to document or talk about. Uh, we have all that equipment available for loan. But yeah, it was just, um, all of that was the, was the, that was the mechanical end of it. And then in terms of mixing all the, all the video, I do that um, at my house. I've got iMovie and a machine dedicated to that. And so I do all the editing myself and add the sounds and all that kind of good stuff. So yeah, it just takes a couple of years of practice and it's easy as pie. Oh, Mark has a question. Is there a list of chemicals that are solely organic or general use that Amish growers can refer to for SW management? Yeah. Well, again, on the, the um, this handout that has that chart that I showed, it does include several things that are OMRI um, listed, it, um, and several things are not um, restricted use. Again, there's a little symbol of which ones are restricted use and which ones are not. So basically, um, if they're OMRI, it pretty much comes, I would recommend Entrust alternated with Grandivo. Um, so, but if they're, if they are not organic, but they're not licensed, then Delegate, um, is a, is the best product, but they'd have to figure something else to alternate it with, uh, like maybe Imidan, Delegate and Imidan, depending on the crop. Okay. Are there any last minute questions? If not, we're going to let you out uh, potentially five minutes early. Oh, Celeste has it. Well, two, yeah, just two points. Also, I was just thinking, Mark, if it's more like backyard. Um, now, again, the backyard products are not supposed to be on crops that are being sold commercially. But if it is just for their backyard, pr probably the one product that um, is labeled across almost all the fruit crops is the spinosad, such as Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. 
is a, a good recommend because you can use it on any of them and it's fairly good on spotted wing. Um, the other comment, I just thought a different subject. Um, we have been asked by, initially we were giving people high powered hand lenses trying to look through those samples. And then we were asked, well, you know, what about microscopes? You know, is there such thing as a low end microscope that's good? So that's where Jim and I did evaluate several low end microscopes. And one thing on the website is just a list of, of different options. The one we really like the best is only $99. For a little scope so we have the the name of that on one of the handouts on the web the web sheet of um, it's from microscope microscopes.com i think um so you know the idea is it really is pretty darn tedious trying to do this with a hand lens and you know so if, for 99 bucks that's a pretty reasonable price we don't know how long they'll hold up we've had some of them i think for three years now and uh, i really like the little scope so um that info is there if you need it Okay, good comment. All right, I don't see anything else. So with that, um, you will be getting a real quick evaluation link from me in a day or two with a link to this video with a little bit of stuff edited out here and there. Uh, this webinar and all of our efforts or a lot of our efforts in Spotted Wing have been uh, funded by USDA NIFA and they require us as part of the funding to do these evaluations. So I really would appreciate if you would just take a minute or two, it's like five or six questions real quick and respond uh, based on you know, what you think you've learned or uh, got out of this webinar. So that'll be coming in a day or two. Please respond if you can. Uh, otherwise, I think we're done. I, I thank Celeste for her hard work. I thank you for attending and hopefully um, you'll have a good season of trapping. If you have any questions as the season goes along, please don't hesitate to give Celeste or myself a call. All right, thank you very much.